May we have your attention, please? Welcome to Sanders Theater. Please turn off all cell phones and other electronic devices. The use of cameras and recording equipment is prohibited. Once again, there is no photography at this event. Please take a moment to identify the nearest exit. In addition to the six regular exits, there are two emergency exits located at the back of the mezzanine and balcony levels. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, whichever one it is for you. I am Emma Dench and I am delighted to welcome you all to Harvard Horizons 2023. But first, you might have noticed something and I want to acknowledge a very exciting event that took place earlier today. You might have noticed that GSAS has a new name. We are now the Harvard Kenneth C. Griffin Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So this is thanks to a generous gift to the Faculty of Arts and Sciences from Kenneth C. Griffin, who's here with us today, I'm delighted to say. So thank you, Mr. Griffin. So a very special day, also a particularly special year for Harvard Horizons. It's the program's 10th anniversary. Woo! <laughs> so that means that more than 80 Harvard Horizon scholars have been selected from scores of applicants. They've been trained and mentored to share their original, erudite, cutting edge research with us in language we can all understand no matter what our disciplinary background is. And they do all this somehow and make it look easy. It's not easy. Very impressive. As we mark Harvard Horizon's 10th anniversary, I want to acknowledge the people who are key to its creation. The brilliant idea of Harvard Horizons came from then Dean Zhaoli Meng and Professor Hisa Kuriyama. Thank you. <laughs> and then the work to bring their vision to life was led by three other amazing people, by um, Laura Fram, John L. Loeb, Associate Professor of the Humanities, Pamela Pollock and Marlon Kuzmik of the Derek Box Center. So warmest thanks to all of you, to Shaoli, to Hisa, to Laura, to Pamela and Marlon, and to GSAS's Sheila Thomas, to all the faculty fellows, many of whom is here tonight as well, and to our alumni who generously supported this program, and everyone else whose tireless work makes, makes all of this possible. So it's already great. How many, how many celebrations can we have? It's already great that we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of Harvard Horizons. But it's even more wonderful that this 10th anniversary falls when we're also celebrating GSAS's 150th anniversary. Whoa. <laughs> Our 2023 scholars exemplify the inquiry, innovation, and impact of our thousands of alumni over the past 150 years, and they provide an exciting glimpse of what's to come in the next 150 years. So now the moment you've all been waiting for, let's introduce this year's 2023 Harvard Horizons Scholars. So, 
Come, scholars. <laughs> From the extreme left, we have Lydia Kresnilkova from Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, Adam Longenbach, Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning, Gary Mitchell, Education. <laughs> Stephen Kasparek, Psychology. Bemisola Abiola, African and African American Studies. Ryan Keane, Social and Behavioral Sciences. Jin Young So, Chemistry and Chemical Biology. And Emilio Vavarella, Art, Film and Visual Studies and Floor Brookharden, Astronomy. And now, let the presentations begin. Hot back summer. We set the stage. It's July 2021. 60% of Massachusetts is vaccinated. Mask mandates are dropping all over the country. Me and my friends are finally going out to our favorite pubs and restaurants, unmasked. Provincetown, Massachusetts is a gorgeous coastal tourist town. It's the weekend after July 4th and there's a huge multi-day party mostly members of the LGBTQ plus community, most of them vaccinated. The weather is gloomy and the rain pushes everyone inside. Bars, clubs, restaurants, all packed, people moving quickly from venue to venue. The stage we've set is perfect. Less than a week later, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health is alerted to a huge COVID outbreak, the first since vaccination. COVID clearly wasn't over. I'm part of a group of disease detectives in the Sabeti Lab at the Broad Institute. We work together with hospitals, universities, departments of public health, and other collaborators to trace and learn from outbreaks. Here's the mystery we solved that summer. The P-Town outbreak was 74% vaccinated. It was clear that vaccinated individuals could get infected. But did vaccinated people also spread SARS-CoV-2? Normally, this question would be answered through contact tracing. But contact tracing SARS-CoV-2 is extremely difficult. You can get infected from a known contact, but you can also get infected from someone you never saw. Because SARS-CoV-2 is airborne, it can transmit from across a restaurant or club. You can have, even transmit without being in the same room as a person at the same time. You can stand in a vestibule, leave, and infect someone who stands in that same vestibule 10 minutes later. So how can you trace an outbreak that spreads through the air? especially in crowded spaces with vast turnover? The answer is that the viruses themselves keep a record of transmission. This record is in their genomes. Viral spread is a game of telephone. The mistakes the virus makes as it spreads inside your body are passed on to the people you infect. When the virus replicates in their bodies, it makes more mistakes, and the people they infect get both those mistakes and yours and so on, with each generation of infections collecting more and more mistakes. We can use these mistakes to recreate an outbreak after it's happened and learn from it. We did just that with the P-Town outbreak. We uh, worked together with the Department of Public Health to recreate this outbreak from genomic data and then add on vaccination data. First, the Department of Public Health sent us transmission events detected through contact tracing data including, as you can see, transmission events from and between vaccinated individuals. Then, we layered on genomic data, showing plenty more transmission events from and between vaccinated individuals. 
When the Department of Public Health went back through their contact tracing data, they were able to validate some of these links, confirming that our methods work. Together, the genomic and the contact tracing data both showed repeated transmission from and between vaccinated individuals. In other words, the answer to our question is yes. Vaccinated people can and do spread SARS-CoV-2. So where does that leave us? Getting vaccinated is still incredibly important. It dramatically reduces your risk of death, severe illness, and long-term effects. But if we want to reduce spread, dramatically reduce spread, especially to vulnerable populations, masking remains one of our biggest, most important tools. It's also easy to forget that each data point in this figure behind me is a human being. Unfortunately, the P-Town outbreak was in effect a natural experiment in the LGBTQ plus community member, members and their loved ones. In part because of this outbreak, the CDC reinstated mask recommendations. I want to show you one more finding from this project, which is actually my favorite finding from this project. A lot of people wondered if the P-Town outbreak seeded the huge Delta wave that followed it. What we found is that actually the opposite happened. Using these methods, we traced the, uh, the descendants of the P-Town outbreak, and we found that even as Delta continued to spread, the P-Town outbreak died out. In other words, this outbreak was contained in the middle of a pandemic. You have to admit that is epic. <laughs> we believe that this outbreak was contained for two reasons. First, because it was largely vaccinated. And other studies have shown that vaccination decreases the time you spend contagious, which decreases your opportunity to infect other people. Second, because infected individuals work together with contact tracers to identify and warn potential contacts, and then protected their loved ones through quarantining and masking. One thing about fast-spreading diseases like SARS-CoV-2 is that they spread exponentially, not linearly. The bright side of this is that the smallest impact you can have on de decreasing spread, especially early on, can have a huge impact on the size of the outbreak and on saving lives. My hope is that what I've shown you today, in terms of what we've been able to learn, is just the tip of the iceberg. We're currently working together with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to learn from more than 100,000 sequences from positive COVID tests. I'm really, really excited to see what we'll learn, so stay tuned. Now, I want to say, as you applaud for me, please also applaud for the 79 co-authors on this study, for everyone who worked on vaccines in this pandemic, and for contact tracers. Thank you so much. Take a look at these four photographs of the same city. Where do you think this place is located? And what are the clues in the photographs that would point you toward your guess? Is it the buildings? The streetscape? The arid climate? Maybe it's the people, their skin color, or how they dress. In the top right, we can see graffiti spray painted on a building. In Arabic, it reads, lift your head up. You are Iraqi. But I can tell you that this place isn't located anywhere near Iraq. If we take a closer look, a recurring detail throws off the scene. Each building has an identifying marker. They label these buildings as property of the US military. That's because not only is this city not in Iraq, it's also not a city at all. Rather, it's an enormous stage set where the U.S. military rehearses operations before deploying them in actual theaters of war. Otherwise known as a mock village, these are full-scale replications of cities and regions under U.S. military occupation. And so this particular mock village is located not in the Middle East, but over 12,000 kilometers away at Fort Irwin, a remote U.S. military base in the Mojave Desert of California. 
It's just one of roughly 100 military mock villages in the United States. These so-called laboratories of war prepare military personnel for real conflict in urban environments. And yet, the mere existence of mock villages affirms how violence in civilian spaces has become a normalized and accepted component of modern warfare. How did this come to be? And why am I, as a trained architect and historian, studying this topic? Well, my interest in military mock villages began about a decade ago. I was living in Seattle at the time, and that's where I learned about how, during the Second World War, the US military used a fake suburban townscape to hide the nearby Boeing aircraft plant from an aerial attack. As I conducted more research on this particular fake town, I then started to learn about the other, more sinister uses of mock villages. Now, oh, I also began to learn about uh, who oversaw their design and construction. It was the US Army Corps of Engineers, but also architects, landscape architects, and set designers from Hollywood studios like Warner Brothers and Walt Disney. Now, based on my historical research in the archives, I examine what I have identified as four distinct ways that the US military initially appropriated architecture for wartime purposes. First, as I mentioned, mock villages were used for visual deception. They camouflaged key military sites on the American home front. Second, mock villages were used to create public propaganda. Replicas of Tokyo, for example, were theatrically destroyed on, for films and photographs in order to mobilize the nation for war. The third, mock villages were the subject of military science. Military personnel studied how German and Japanese homes were made in order to understand how they could be unmade using lethal force. And lastly, mock villages were used for the physical and psychological conditioning of troops. Also called combat towns, these were highly immersive environments for exposing soldiers to the harsh realities of fighting in foreign cities. A key component of that immersion was called hate training. This is a strategy in psychological warfare that attempts to vilify and completely dehumanize entire nations and ethnic groups in order to label them as enemies deserving violence. Here, the architecture of foreign cities is used by US military personnel as a kind of visual cue to elicit feelings of hostility and bloodlust in American soldiers. So since the 1940s, mock villages have changed and they continue to change to reflect regions around the globe. They are, in effect, a portrait of the world as seen through military eyes. Today, for added realism, the US military hires people of the Afghani and Iraqi diaspora to populate its simulated environments. These individuals might play act as everyday you know, people going about their lives. Others play the role of insurgents or terrorists. The point is, there remains this underlying assumption that civilians are part of the battlefield. And now, in addition to conditioning troops, mock villages are used for everything from practicing aerial maneuvers, to weapons tests, drone warfare. But what began as a US military technology has since become a global instrument of war. No longer confined to the United States, there are now an estimated 400 mock villages around the globe. For example, since 2005, U.S. Marines and Israeli Defense Forces have trained together in a mock Palestinian village in the Negev Desert. Ukrainian troops are using mock villages organized by American and British troops. Meanwhile, there's evidence that Russia is doing the same. Satellite imagery tells us that the People's Liberation Army of China is constructing mock U.S. warships and bases in the Taklamakan Desert. And mock villages are also no longer just for military use. In response to civil unrest of the 1960s, police departments began using mock villages to practice so-called anti-riot tactics. And today, police continue to train using these operations that, as I've shown, 
are rooted in military logistics. As we speak, protesters are trying to stop the development of Cop City, a proposed police training facility outside of Atlanta, Georgia. So here's my overarching point. In the 1940s, the invention of a novel form of architecture, the military mock village, coincided with the invention of new forms of mass violence that we're still dealing with today. It is an ongoing case of construction begetting destruction, of simulated hostility enabling real harm. At stake in my research, then, is a critical understanding of how anybody, any building, or any city risks being replicated and repurposed by militaries and police in order to enact violence against it. Thank you so much. Son, you've got to be twice as good to get half as far. That's something I heard a lot growing up from my father, who is right there tonight. <laughs> and, and it's not just him who said this, and it's not just me who's heard this, but this is a familiar axiom often passed from black parent to black child, each word laced with an enduring understanding of what it takes to combat society's script of black inferiority. This phrase passed from generation to generation, replicated throughout the black American experience like a mutated gene, provides accelerant when we're on the brink of success, and serves as our salve when said success proves elusive. Now, take a moment and imagine what it might look like for an entire educational institution, not just a family, to internalize this message to facilitate extreme upward mobility through educational attainment, ultimately surpassing this well-known maxim. Well, in fact, there exist a number of such programs. They work to alter students' paths by preparing to meet them at a critical point in their educational journeys in middle school, where paths so exponentially diverge. They alter students' paths by preparing them to leave their public school system and enter the world of elite, private, boarding, and day schools, much like the ones that you see here. In studying one of these programs that I refer to as Uplift Academy, I ask questions that help us understand the intended and unintended consequences of our attempts to redress societal inequality. Uplift Academy is a nonprofit organization that works each year to launch a cohort of 14 and 15 year old black and brown students to and through elite independent educational institutions. In studying Uplift, I ask what are the costs borne by Uplift students on their journeys of upward mobility? I'm a scholar of education, and I use sociological and ethical tools to help us understand these attempts to redress societal inequality through the diversification of elite spaces, much like this one. To answer my questions, I took a year to conduct hundreds of hours of observations and over 100 interviews of members of the Uplift community. My findings are a bit complicated, but I'd like to share a snapshot of them with you here today. I've found that Uplift students experience what I term an arc of ethical injury a process whereby they feel their racial identities are recognized and then stripped down and then monumented for institutional gain. Being twice as good might get them in the door, but then what happens? Once at their school, students gain access to educational and social privilege that they could not have otherwise dreamed of, and they even serve as faces of diversity on campus. But what is a face without its features? What are the invisible burdens that these students bear? Upon arriving at Uplift, students experience a fullness of color and self through congregation with those of shared background and shared academic aspiration. 
One alum said it was very easy to work hard when you were surrounded by people who were working as hard as you, looked like you, from the same backgrounds as you. Paradoxically, it is also during this time that students' identities were first stripped as a, as a result of exposure to the elements of white upper-class society. Their speech was corrected, their hobbies and interests called into question, and their families distanced at times. One alum said that uplift was essentially stripping away your blackness, while another said that through things like etiquette classes, uplift was assimilating us into the places we were going to go into. However, rather than prepare them, this exposure merely weathered them, reminding them of just how different they were. Once at their campuses, this stripping made students suitable monuments of diversity to be upheld as stories of successful integration. One student shared an instance of a photographer capturing a moment of her and her diverse friend group saying, it's just like, oh, you'll publish us on your website to show, oh, it's so diverse, look at everything we're doing. Meanwhile, we're having all these problems. Despite the pedestal that they've been placed on, students often felt isolated from campus life. And much like these statues right here today, they adorned, college, they adorned high school campuses without being able to move freely. And even in instances where students felt they were respected leaders on campus, they said that it sometimes felt like they had to continually earn their place. One student shared, if I stop doing the things at my school that I usually do, like being the leader, I always feel like the school's going to look at me like, oh, we're not getting our money's worth anymore. Twice as good indeed has a look, and it's one that can be objectified for institutional gain. However, wherever there is oppression, there is resistance. And this arc of ethical injury is no exception. In the face of these processes, students find way to reclaim and develop their identities, especially as it pertains to race, ethnicity, and culture. One alum shared this sentiment saying, it wasn't until I got to adulthood and I went to college and I majored in Africana studies and sociology that I could process what I'd been through, which changed my entire worldview. And another alum shared that up at Uplift, it was like, what does it mean to be you in white spaces? I had to, especially after college and during the pandemic when I was by myself alone, really reflect on what it means just to be me. And perhaps there are ways to confer new kinds of capital to students beyond human, social, and cultural to prepare them for environments that are primed to weather and monument them. One Uplift alum shared this sentiment stating, I get what Uplift was doing and why they did it because that's sort of what we needed to succeed in the environments that we went into. But those tools weren't even enough. What would have been better is to affirm us in who we are because who we are shouldn't have to change. So, if being twice as good isn't enough and getting half as far certainly isn't either, then where does that leave us? Well, for one, I argue that we must debunk the myths that these mobility journeys are not injurious to those who take them. And two, our focus must be to change elite settings, to fundamentally incorporate marginalized populations into every fiber of the institution. Doing so is by no means a social cure, but it does have the power to allow educational experiences to transform students into their fullest color, that they might bring us closer to the society that we all so desperately need. Thank you. Up to 60% of children raised in the United States experience violence. This includes experiencing physical or sexual abuse or witnessing domestic or community violence. And the more violence children experience, the more likely they are to develop mental health problems like depression and anxiety. And I would know. I experienced and witnessed violence as a child born and raised in under-resourced neighborhoods of St. Louis, Missouri, including Ferguson a place now associated with 
police violence, and Black Lives Matter protests following the murder of Michael Brown. To me, however, Ferguson was just where I grew up, and it wasn't until after I left Ferguson for college that I was able to reflect on my childhood. And I've since realized that most people who grow up in places like I did don't end up speaking with big audiences of wonderful people like you in beautiful spaces like this one, and especially not at institutions like Harvard. The question is why? Why do kids like me rarely end up here? As a PhD student in clinical psychology here at Harvard, I strive to better understand which factors help us predict who's most likely to develop mental health problems after experiencing violence. And today, I'll tell you about some of the research I've done to begin addressing this question. To start, I recruited a large sample of 100 children represented here as dots. The children were recruited between ages five and six years old, and we collected data from them over several years until they were between nine and 10 years old to help us better understand how early experiences relate to mental health outcomes down the road. At the first wave of data collection, when children were between five and six, we conducted extensive interviews with their caregivers to learn about the children's exposure to violence. We then used that information to separate kids into two groups. Every kid in the violence-exposed group reported experiencing things like being beat up in their community, being hit really hard at home by family members, or seeing caregivers hit each other. None of the kids in the non-exposed group reported experiencing any violence. Two years later, when kids were between seven and eight years old, we interviewed the families about the children's depression and anxiety symptoms, which enabled us to tease apart who was doing relatively well and who was at risk for suffering. We also had the kids complete a task designed to measure differences in how they process social information. Now, social information might include the behaviors of others or whether people are similar to or different from us in important ways. And humans use this information to differentiate between in-groups made up of people we trust, identify with, and feel safe with, and out-groups made up of those we may not connect with or who may feel dangerous to us. And this process helps us to form and prioritize the social bonds most likely to contribute to our well-being. But how might this relate to violence exposure? Well, children seeing people hurt each other or being hurt themselves would likely be an important source of social information they would use to inform whether they trust and connect with the people around them. And so to test this theory, I randomly assigned the kids in my study to one of two groups made up of other fictional kids their same age and gender. And though the assignments were random, the kids were told that all the other kids in their group had similar interests, such as having the same favorite toy. We then used the behavioral task to measure how much the kids subconsciously favored this new in-group compared to the out-group, and we call that bias in-group favoritism. The ability to quickly develop in-group favoritism for new groups is really important for humans because as a social species, we need to form strong in-group bonds to survive and thrive. Take a moment to think about where you'd be without close friends, close colleagues, and family. And finally, two years later, when kids were between nine and 10 years old, we remeasured their symptoms of depression and anxiety. So just to quickly recap, at ages five to six, we measured violence exposure. Two years later, when kids were seven to eight, we measured depression and anxiety symptoms and also measured in-group favoritism. And then when they were nine to 10, we re-measured symptoms of depression and anxiety. And from this intensive five-year study, we learned that kids who, experience, who did not experience violence developed strong in-group favoritism, which is what we would normally expect. However, those who experienced violence developed much weaker in-group favoritism by comparison. We also learned that those who developed strong in-group favoritism were less likely to develop depression and anxiety symptoms over the following two years. However, those who developed weaker in-group favoritism developed more symptoms of depression and anxiety. And because we measured these things over time, we were able to show using advanced statistical modeling that experiencing violence may cause weaker in-group favoritism, which may in turn cause worsening depression and anxiety. And that means we've identified reduced in-group favoritism as a new mental health risk factor. But remember, each of these dots is a child. So what might this look like in the life of a child? 
Well, experiencing violence may make it harder for children to trust people throughout life. In turn, it may be harder for them to form social bonds and integrate into new social groups. And this may put violence-exposed youth at increased risk for depression and anxiety because, as we've been talking about, strong in-group bonds are necessary for our mental health and well-being. That said, I have hope. And what I really want each of you to take away from this talk today is a sense of hope as well. Establishing this new mental health risk factor is a crucial first step, but the ultimate goal is to partner with clinicians and other scientists to translate this knowledge into new treatment and prevention strategies. Those strategies may be able to help protect violence-exposed youth from developing the mental health problems that may ultimately undermine their success and well-being. And my personal dream is, if we succeed in that goal, maybe more kids like me can make it to places like this. Thank you. Bring back our girls. I'm sure you've seen this hashtag and heard of the story of over 250 schoolgirls abducted by Boko Haram from the town of Chibok in Borno State in Nigeria in 2014. What you may not have heard about are the stories of over 2 million people displaced by Boko Haram and Iswap in northeast Nigeria. As an anthropologist, I traveled to Maiduguri, the capital city of Borno State, multiple times between 2018 and 2021 to study internal displacement. I did this study because I had two central concerns. One, I wanted to understand how internally displaced people, IDPs, whose stories never made it to the headlines, survive in different displacement sites. Camps, settlements, and host communities. Two, I wanted to learn how displacement impacted social and economic life. Come with me to Borno. Over 1.6 million of the over 2 million people displaced in northeast Nigeria are hosted there. A state that is affectionately called the home of peace had its peace turned sour in 2009 by being the origin and center of Boko Haram's operations. At 72,000 kilometers square, Borno is about the size of Scotland. It has 27 local government areas or districts, over 30 ethnic peoples and languages, with Islam and Christianity equally practiced. In following the stories of internal displacement, I understood that this diversity will equally manifest in the complexity of this ongoing tragedy. As an anthropologist, I understood the danger of a single story. And so, unlike previous research that study one displacement site, I studied camps, a settlement, and a host community. Bakasi Camp, one of the 290 camps in Northeast Nigeria. It hosts over 40,000 IDPs and is a recipient of humanitarian support from the state and NGOs. Medina to Settlement, an informally organized camp that hosts over 1,600 households and is sometimes a recipient of aid. Wulari Host Community, one of the over 2,000 IDP communities in Northeast Nigeria. In this town, IDPs pay their rent, are housed by family or adopted family, or are philanthropists. 
Also, unlike previous research that study one isolated group, together with my research assistant, I conducted interviews and focus group discussions with over 1,200 IDPs and their hosts from six local government areas across over 15 ethnic groups, comparing the experiences of people from different demographics, gender, religion, and occupation across these three sites. By doing this, I made many important findings, and I'll share three of them with you today. Please pay attention. First, there is a revolving cycle of displacement. Here is the story of Abba, who got displaced when his hometown was attacked. As an IDP, he flees and crosses the border to Cameroon. Here, he becomes a refugee and stays in one of the camps in Cameroon for a few months. Then, he returns to Meiduguri to reunite with his family, and he becomes an IDP in one of the camps. As the government's policy of camp closures begin to take effect, he is made to return to one of the government-allocated housing units, and here he becomes a returnee. Then Boko Haram strikes again, and he flees, once again becoming an IDP. This then defines Abbas' cycle of displacement. From IDP to refugee to returnee, then back to being an IDP. Second, just as, um, just as you have IDPs and their hosts come up with creative strategies of survival, you find many stories where people display entrepreneurial spirit. On the screen here is Asta, who sells her family's food rations and uses the money to start a business. How about Rebecca, who, hosting over 10 IDPs at her home, registers herself as an IDP so she can receive humanitarian support and be able to feed both her family and the IDPs with her. There are so many stories of resilience and entrepreneurship in spite of the inadequacies or inadequate provisions of the government. Third, just as aspects of social and economic life are lost, something new is gained. But what is gained comes at a cost. For what is lost, think of Aminu, who has lost access to his farmlands. Or of Martha, who has lost her community of family and, and friends. Think of Jato who has lost his multi-million Naira business. Or Anatu, born in displacement, but has no memory of home. Don't forget other Nigerians who fled, leaving behind businesses, property, and industries, some of which no longer function till today. The losses are numerous, and they extend beyond Borno. For what is gained, think of Mariam, who, being a mother and having children, was never allowed to work. But when she lost her husband, she got the experience, or her first experience, of financial independence by being a stipend recipient of an NGO. Think of Babagana who lost his home in Mongono, but now because he's in Meiduguri, his children receive scholarships to attend better schools there. Then there's Atawa, 
who, in spite of her qualification, was never able to get a job at her hometown. But now she's a contract worker with an NGO and in a decent five-figure salary. I have learned so much from doing this work. I have learned that in spite of our differences in ethnicity, religion, culture, or even race, there is much that unites us than divides us. Current events in Ukraine have captured global attention, as well as the displacement there. But my work asks us not to look away from the displacement occurring elsewhere, but to instead show solidarity for our collective human suffering. This is because the words of Warson Shire ring true. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun. Thank you. Imagine a kid who's just nine years old. Let's call him Josh. Josh wears a big smile and a baseball cap. He lives with his mom in a small home. He goes around telling everyone his big dreams of becoming a doctor. But year after year, Josh's life takes an unexpected turn. At age 10, Josh's mom is forced to reduce the heat in the winter just to be able to pay rent. At age 11, they lose the home. Josh is separated from his mother, and he's sent to live with a friend just to avoid homelessness. Then, at age 12, his circumstances lead him through a temporary stay in foster care, and by age 16, Josh has cycled through eight different housing situations and has ultimately landed in a state of homelessness. That big smile and those big dreams. They've all started to fade away. As a life course epidemiologist, I study how the adverse housing experiences like Josh's impact child health and development over time. Specifically, when exactly do these experiences pose the greatest risk to health and development, and how might they accumulate and change over time? And so today, I want to take you through. Some of my work. First, you might be asking, "Well, Ryan, what exactly is housing insecurity?" Well, let me tell you. So, despite being one of the most egregious public health failures of our time, the U.S. has no standard definition for housing insecurity. And so, in order for me to be able to study it, I have to repeatedly assess these experiences that children like Josh are going through. And what I can tell you from this is that we must act now. You see, housing insecurity gets under the skin. It alters the biological processes that make up our health and developmental outcomes. And in fact, there's a term for this. It's called biological embedding. So let's take a look at that. You see, with children being particularly sensitive to their environment. It's possible that the chaos and the disruption specific to housing insecurity leads to a series of biological responses that ultimately result in inflammation. And so, specifically, the brain picks up that something harmful is happening to the child, and so it sends a message through the body's stress pathways, telling the immune system to just slightly increase levels of inflammation to protect the child. But you see, these good intentions don't actually stop the housing insecurity, and so they eventually turn into damaging states 
of chronic inflammation. Importantly, I can test whether or not this is occurring by looking at levels of a molecule known as C-reactive protein. And so the task becomes, can I, as a life course epidemiologist, test whether or not inflammation is a viable mechanism for the biological embedding of housing insecurity? To date, most research on housing insecurity and health is cross-sectional. So if I were doing a cross-sectional study, I would take a representative sample from the larger population, I would measure all of the variables that I'm interested in at one time, and I would just use basic statistical tests to see whether or not housing insecurity is associated with some particular health outcome. But this doesn't tell me which came first, the housing insecurity or the health outcome. And so it doesn't give me much insight into cause and effect relationships that make up mechanisms of biological embedding. That's why I focus on longitudinal studies. I take the same sample of children, and I measure the same variables repeatedly over long periods of time. In doing so, I know when the housing insecurity occurred, and I know when the health outcome developed. And that allows me to gain insight into cause and effect relationships. And therefore, I can test mechanisms of biological embedding. An ongoing debate in my field, however, is that housing insecurity is really just a subtype or a consequence of family income poverty. And in fact, some cross-sectional work says that this could be true. That would mean that if I just solved the income problem, then I would also prevent the housing insecurity. But the other side of that debate argues that while they're similar, they're related, they share a number of characteristics, they're not exactly the same. And so this is where I started. I took measures of family income poverty and housing insecurity, and I separated them. And then I tested their independent association with mental health outcomes. And what I found is that while family income poverty didn't necessarily lead to any significant differences in levels of anxiety and depression, housing insecurity actually increased anxiety and depression symptoms in children. This finding was critical to the work. It showed me that housing insecurity is not just a subtype or a consequence of family income poverty. It showed me that housing insecurity has its own distinct impact on health, and it allowed me to move forward in testing whether housing insecurity itself could induce inflammation in children. And so by applying cutting-edge longitudinal modeling methods to these many facets of housing insecurity, I found that even one experience of housing insecurity could lead to a significant increase in levels of C-reactive protein. I also saw that children who experienced housing insecurity at age 14 demonstrated the largest increases in levels of C-reactive protein. And I also, because of how rigorously I analyzed the data, I was able to extrapolate those findings and say that repeated or chronic exposure to housing insecurity could lead to a multiplicative increase in levels of C-reactive protein. This work strongly suggests that inflammation is a potential mechanism for the biological embedding of housing insecurity. And so moving forward, I can now look to see if this specific inflammation caused by housing insecurity is also associated with long-term chronic inflammatory conditions, like cardiovascular disease. This understanding of how housing insecurity gets under the skin, how it becomes biologically embedded in our being and influences health and developmental outcomes across the lifespan, can change how we approach public health and medical interventions. In fact, the medical community originally conceptualized this idea of housing prescriptions as health care, where essentially you could go to your doctor and you could be prescribed housing. But it's not quite that simple. You see, when you take an antibiotic, you also drink a lot of water, you rest, you eat well, you seek support. You have to do the same things with housing prescriptions. They must be supported by and integrated with a number of complementary resources. 
because that is the only way they can be safe, sustainable, and they can prevent children like Josh from slipping back into situations of housing insecurity. My research helps to advance the science behind that type of intervention, an intervention that stops the biological embedding of housing insecurity. Thank you. Imagine being in this theater on a hot summer day without air conditioning. Pretty uncomfortable, right? What you might not know is that the very technology keeping us cool is now warming the planet. Air conditioning relies on fluids called refrigerants. Most refrigerants we use today are hydrofluorocarbons, which are extremely potent greenhouse gases. As you use them, they leak into the atmosphere. Trapping heat, releasing back to Earth. So now we're stuck in a vicious cycle. To adapt to the rapidly changing climate, we need air conditioning. But as we use more and more ACs, the planet keeps getting warmer. This is a big problem. But maybe not a big problem for a first-year graduate student in chemistry. <laughs> When I first arrived at Harvard, I never thought I'd be working on anything related to climate change. I was drawn to fundamental science questions. I just wanted to tinker with molecules and understand why they do what they do. And I started with a material known as two-dimensional perovskite. Why? Well, we chemists we're visual creatures. We love pretty structures. So along with my advisor, Professor Jerry Mason. I was drawn to this material simply because it looks interesting. Two-dimensional perovskite features inorganic sheets that are formed by corner-sharing metal halide. They serve as a template that holds the long organic chains. And these organic chains pack into a bilayer structure. What caught our attention was these organic bilayers can do something very strange. They're dynamic. They can switch between order and disorder. When you increase temperature, this long, fluffy chain starts vibrating, wiggling, and twisting. And at around room temperature, they undergo a sharp phase transition. They expand, storing a high density of thermal energy. What is fascinating is that these chains are so disordered; they resemble molecules in a liquid. In other words, this. It's a solid that behaves like a liquid. You can always transform these chains back to order by simply lowering temperature. When you lower the temperature, chains become frozen, releasing heat. The bilayers contract. I was fascinated by this phenomena, and I began to synthesize a wide range of compounds featuring these organic bilayers, and I studied their phase transitions. I was using this material as a playground. To explore the relationships between molecular structures and thermal energy, like I said, we chemists we love to tinker with interesting structures. At the same time, this fundamental investigation got me thinking about what I could do with these unusual solids. So first, I started imagining different ways to control this transition. For example, I thought instead of using temperature, we should be able to use pressure. To control their state, because these bilayers are squishy. When you compress this material, they contract. They contract, and by contracting, they release heat. You can also reverse it back by removing pressure. When you remove pressure, they slowly expand, absorbing heat. So I was thinking about this idea. While doing so, I started reading papers outside chemistry. I came across a group of people, philosophers, engineers, and physicists who have been studying heat in solid, and some of them have been trying to use solids for cooling. For example, squeezing certain materials can trigger phase transition 
and temperature change, which can be used to move heat. But the problem is, this process is often not reversible unless you apply extremely large pressure. Okay, so I found this paper interesting, but nothing really happened for weeks. But then, it hit me. I realized the material that I've been studying all along, this strange solid that behaves like a liquid, might be an ideal refrigerant for cooling. These organic bilayers are compressible, and their transitions involve substantial changes in energy and volume. The combination of this property should allow them to absorb, release a large amount of heat at low pressure. And this reversible process, when combined with a proper heat transfer system, can be used to move heat from inside to outside, providing cooling. So after I made this conceptual leap, I spent the past four years establishing this material as new class of solid refrigerant. To study how to respond to pressure, I spent many hours in the lab performing a series of high-pressure experiments. In doing so, I was able to understand and improve their cooling performance. In one of these experiments, I measured the sensitivity of phase transition to pressure to get the diagram, so-called a phase diagram. And using this diagram, we could also perform an experiment to directly measure the flow of heat that goes in and out of the material as we change pressure. And using this experiment, we're able to demonstrate these organic bilayers indeed provide a powerful mechanism for cooling. So now we're convinced that these solid refrigerants open many exciting possibilities. By replacing these harmful gas refrigerants, we can finally break the feedback loop between cooling and climate change. We can also go beyond the climate impact. We can start reinventing air conditioning. We can develop cooling devices that are efficient and compact. And more excitingly, we can even bring this invention to the places where conventional cooling technology don't work really well, like in outer space. Now, we are working with engineers to build a prototype cooling device. We're going to bring this discovery to life. So, this is a story of how a chemist ended up working on air conditioning. I never thought tinkering with molecule in the lab would lead to a possible solution to climate change. But I think that's the beauty of fundamental research. It's not always clear where my exploration will lead me, but when the right connections are made, it can lead to unexpected turns with unexpected discovery. So, what's next? I don't know. <laughs> What I do know is I'm excited to continue my journey as a chemist, hunting for the next discovery. Thank you. My work begins by creating a space of interdisciplinary research. My work is not bound to a particular material or discipline. It moves between different forms of art and theoretical experimentation. My goal is to investigate our relationship with technology. But for way too long, technology and culture have been seen as opposites. My work begins with a refusal of this binary division. On the one hand, I refuse techno-determinism, which is roughly the idea that technology determines cultural values. But I also refuse a reductive view of technology as the mere product of culture. I find that reality is more complex and it's full of interactions between ideas, between materials and concepts, between different disciplines. And it is by paying attention to these complex connections that we can begin to understand how technology and culture constantly influence one another. My doctoral research began six years ago, 
I was studying the beginning of perspectival drawing during the Renaissance, and I was struck by learning that the same rules used by painters and architects to represent space were also used to understand the functions of the human eye. In other words, the rules of perspectival drawing were informing an understanding of human vision. So I asked myself, is this just a rare historical occurrence? Or are there other moments in history when specific techniques or technologies shaped a certain understanding of human faculties? In order to find out, I had to push my gaze as far back in history as I was able to. And my journey begins by looking at ancient clay artifacts in connection to some of the earliest myths, stories, and incantations that have survived to our days. I was particularly fascinated by the myths according to which a supernatural being molded the first humans out of clay. Now, these myths attempted to answer the age-old question of where do we come from, but they also corresponded to specific sets of technologies, like pottery wheels and pottery ovens, and specific sets of techniques, like sculpting, molding, and making clay. So the technical knowledge of producing clay artifacts was shaping a story about the possible origin of human beings. I coined the term media model to describe the process we are now familiar with, the extraction of an abstract model out of a specific technique or technology and the use of that model in different contexts. Every time we talk about the eye as a lens, or the heart as a pump, or our brain as a computer, we are not simply using metaphors. We are talking about how techniques and technologies shape our understanding of ourselves. My next example brings us to some of the earliest techniques for irrigation. And my research suggests that all of our concepts and ideas are always grounded in specific techniques. So in conjunction, with the development of techniques to irrigate the fields and deviate the course of water streams, the human body is reconceptualized as a complex system of circulation. A healthy body was a body in which fluids were flowing well. Illness, on the contrary, could be caused by a blockage in this flow or by a wound causing a spillage of precious bodily fluids. Now, this hydraulic model persisted for centuries, and something important to keep in mind is that media models don't simply succeed one another. They often coexist, even though some of them may reach a hegemonic state and may converge. So let's jump to the 17th century. I'll show you how this can happen. This is a moment marked by the development of new mechanical technologies like pendulum clocks and pocket watches. And at first, hydraulics plays a major role in this mechanization. But the emphasis starts to shift from how to make things flow better to using hydraulics to better mechanize things. And my research shows that in conjunction with this process of mechanization, the human body is reconceptualized once again, this time as an automaton, a complex system of cogs, pivots, body parts that respond mechanically to the displacement of weights. My next example brings us to the end of the 19th century. This is a time marked by the development of new mechanical technologies, and just like hydraulics fueled mechanization, mechanics fuels computation. These new mechanical devices, in fact, had a specific goal. Their goal was to automate computation. And my research shows that in conjunction with the non-linear development of these mechanical devices, eventually leading to the modern computer of today, the human body is reconceptualized once again according to a computational model. Our brain became understood as a computational machine. Thought became a computational process. Perception became a form of data rendering. Memory a kind of data storage, and knowledge itself became information. What I brought today is just a limited set of examples 
of how media models shaped the understanding of the human body in circulatory, mechanical and computational terms. But my research shows that the impact of media models goes well beyond the understanding of the body. When the hydraulic media model was hegemonic, our ancestors created stories according to which gods created our planet out of a cosmic ocean. But in the 17th century, the cosmos took the form of a mechanical apparatus, and God himself was pictured as a clockmaker. Today, scientists think about the very fabric of our universe, space and time, in computational terms. Secondly, what I brought today is just a limited set of examples and materials of a global history of media models that hasn't been written yet. Media models are not a particularity of Western civilizations. They can be found across all geographic locations and throughout the entire history of human life. And finally, my research shows how media models are one of the most effective ways we have developed to produce answers, but they also shape the questions that at any given time can be posed. We could say that to each media model corresponds a certain horizon of meaning, a set of possible thoughts that can be formulated and expressed. Each media model is limited in its own specific way, and this means that a history of media models is not a history of progress. Hydraulic models fail to take into account the more mechanical aspects of reality, and mechanical models ignore the more fluid aspects of reality. Computational models, they tend to ignore aspects of reality that cannot be easily quantified. So, looking back, I started this journey six years ago, thinking about the ways in which perspectival drawing was informing human vision, and what I found is that beyond human vision, the very way we see ourselves and our world has always been influenced by the techniques and technologies available to us. And so as we navigate a world increasingly more dominated by computational technologies, I believe it is more important than ever to pay attention to how every technology shapes our sense of reality. Thank you. For me, massive stars are the dinosaurs of our universe. Because similarly to how paleontologists use fossils to study dinosaurs, I use the fossils of these massive stars, black holes, to understand how massive stars once formed, lived and died. Now let me unpack this for you. So, Compared to our sun, shown here, massive stars can be 10 to 200 times as massive. They are rare. Only one in a thousand stars is born as a massive star. And they live fast and die young, with lifetimes a thousand times shorter than that of our own sun. And this is why typically, only one massive star will be found among a population of millions. This makes it so challenging to find and study many of them in our own Milky Way, let alone in other environments, such as more distant galaxies. Little is known about these massive stars. But one thing we do know is that they play a pivotal role in shaping our universe through all these processes. They produce all the oxygen that we breathe here today. There's something else that's absolutely fascinating about these massive stars, and that is that they're often formed in pairs, a binary. And the life of a star in a pair can be drastically different from that of a single star. They can interact, exchange mass, and these massive stars, when they end their lives, 
they go supernova in these bright explosions and form black holes. Now, if these stars can survive all these phases and stay together, they can form a black hole pair. Here shown with marvels. And these black hole pairs can spiral in over billions and billions of years until they eventually collide into a slightly more massive black hole. Now, in 2015, for the first time, scientists observed such a collision between two black holes. And this raised the opportunity to ask the question: Can we use these black hole collisions to study how stars formed, lived, and died in the past? As an astronomer, I am working on the tools and framework to make this happen and to open up a new frontier that we call gravitational wave paleontology. So, what are gravitational waves, and how do we detect these black hole collisions? Well, all around us in the vast universe, there are these pairs of black holes that occasionally collide, during which they unleash these bursts of gravitational waves that can travel through space for millions of years until they reach us here on Earth, where they squeeze and stretch the Earth itself. Here, vastly exaggerated. But these small wiggles can be picked up by laser interferometers here on Earth, where they will find a signal that looks something like this for the first black hole. And this signal is called a chirp, because if you were to listen to it, it would sound something like whoop. <laughs> And from these chirps or signals, scientists can infer the properties of the black holes, such as their masses. That we hope to then use to probe the physics of black holes and the stars that once upon a time formed them. Now, something cool is that these pairs of stars only take just a few million years to form the pair of black holes, but once you have a pair of black holes, it can take billions and billions and billions and billions of years before they actually collide. And so, the gravitational waves that we see today, even locally, They actually probe these stars and how these stars lived to very deep into the universe, possibly as far away as to the edge of our observable universe. However, these stars, these gravitational waves themselves, don't directly tell us about the properties of the stars. So, in practice, we need to forward model how these stars evolve and form gravitational wave sources. Compared to how maybe we don't directly see feathers in a fossil of a dinosaur, but we can think about how feathers leave behind imprints on the fossils we see today. And so, together with my collaborators, we developed the tools to model the evolution of these stars. And in practice, this looks something like a factory, like this, that takes in hypothetical pairs of stars with, for instance, different masses, and can calculate. Their physics and how they evolve, and whether they form such a gravitational wave source, a black hole collision. Now, there's a challenge, however, because these simulations become extremely computationally expensive, because pairs of stars only rarely form a gravitational wave source. In most cases, they disrupt as a pair when the supernova goes off. And so, in practice, I'm looking for that one in a million stellar pair of stars that can stay together forever and collide as black holes. I tackled this challenge by combining data science with astrophysics and developing a new machine learning technique that can speed up these simulations and more efficiently find these gravitational wave sources. And this machine learning tool actually is very similar to playing a game of Battleship. So in this game, you try to find the locations of your opponent's ships, and in principle, you could do this completely random. But I bet that most of you actually use this tactic on the right, or maybe in the beginning, you guess randomly. But then once you find a hit, you explore around it and refine. My algorithm does something very similar, but in this case, it doesn't apply to these simulations of massive stars. 
And so now we're actually looking for the properties of stars, the locations, in, for instance, the parameter space of masses, such that stars, pairs of stars, form a gravitational wave source, a hit. But there's many, many more challenges. For example, we're not just dealing with two dimensions, but actually with many, many dimensions, because these stars can have many different properties, such as separations and eccentricity. But by using these tools, I managed to make these simulations a hundred times faster, which means that now a simulation, instead of taking an entire year, it just takes a few days. A huge win. And so with these tools in hand, we can now start to model the evolution of these massive stars and how they form gravitational wave sources. And the timing couldn't have been better. Because in 2015, we detected the first three collisions between black holes, but this has already rapidly grown to now a total of hundreds of these collisions that we have observed. But most excitingly, in the next decades, we're going to grow this to millions of detections per year with new and updated detectors. And I'm excited that with my research, we can use these detections to study how stars formed, lived, and died in the past, and ultimately to help address some of the biggest open questions in astronomy today. How did the very first stars live? How are these gravitational wave sources formed? And how was our universe enriched with elements such as oxygen and gold produced by these massive stars and their collisions? We have already learned so much and we have just started. I am excited to see what's next. Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How brilliant were you? My only, I always moan on this day, you're a really hard act to follow. You're really, it's impossible. Um, and you did make it so easy. And everybody, don't you feel super smart? <laughs> Scholars, put me out of the, my misery, come back on stage. <laughs> Lydia, Adam, Gary, Stephen, Benisola, Ryan, Jin Young, Emilio, and Floor. Absolutely amazing, look. <laughs> and now we'd love to invite you to join all of us for a reception in the transept. Please join us. And thank, let's thank our Harvard Horizons 2023 scholars one last time.